Today I'm going to show you two things. One is how to convert raw data to radiance and then from radiance to reflectance. Obviously to go from raw to reflectance, if that's what you choose to do, is just eliminating the radiance step. Before we begin anything, we need two things. One is raw data, such as this. Notice there's a folder for dark here that contains the dark capture that was done just prior to the data acquisition. The second thing that you need to verify is that in your head wall folder, in the sensor config, that the sensor you are using, in this case, NHS223, NHS223 is contained within your directory. The reason for this is you need a radio cal file and inside of that you need this structure and data. If you are missing these and you don't have the correct lens, then you cannot perform the particular radiance conversion you wish. Since everything is in place, we just go ahead and start Spectral View. We will open one of the data cubes. This is NHS223. We'll open one of the data cubes randomly. We'll select all the data. So we're using every wavelength that we've captured and the file opens. We want to see if this is raw data. Just open the spectrograph view and click. This is the typical peak and plot of raw data, green grass, northern hemisphere. Now, if we want to convert this particular data set to radiance, what we do is simply click the radiance button. You notice the file and application have to match. So this is going to the radio calibration folder of your 12 millimeter lens and opening up this particular file. It asks for the dark reference. That is what I mentioned earlier, where it is the dark reference here that was taken just before data collection. Now we've got the radio calibration file. We've got the raw data. It is going to put the header and data file of radiance into this particular folder. In this case, I'm simply putting it back into the folder that contains the raw data. You can choose with the ellipsis, any particular folder or create a new one. That said, we just create the cube. And then open it, selecting all the wavelengths again. You'll notice this is a, an eight gigabit RAM machine it takes a little while for the single radiance cube to open because we've taken the raw data, applied the correction, and it's now twice the size file as before. You'll also note that when you do radiance conversion, you will end up with some white spots here, depending on what scene you are using. These are shadows. So if you apply a radiance correction to a shadow, you're going to get something other than a wavelength back because a shadow has no wavelength. These are trees, leaves will cast shadows. Now again, this right here is our raw data. This on the other hand is the plot for radiance converted data. The difference is obvious. We've done one cube on a 
mission that has multiple cubes and flight lines. So if you want to convert everything to radiance, you've done one cube, you're satisfied, it is giving the results that you would like, you use batch and then radiance batch. What this allows you to do is select multiple data cubes. When selecting multiple files for the batch radiance, hold down the control and select the desired files. You can select multiple data cubes. You click next. Notice it again asks for the dark reference. Navigate and select that. And then here, you will simply perform the batch radiance conversion. Each file when written is dropped into the selected folder. When the value hits 100%, everything is complete. You now have radiance cubes. I'll verify that by selecting cube 9440. If I go in here, 9440, the suffix RD indicates that it is a radiance data cube. We'll select all the wavelengths. With the cube opened, you can verify that it is, in fact, a radiance data cube because it has the classic shape and it especially has your oxygen band right in here. The reason I chose this is the following. The next step that you want is to be able to take your radiance data and convert that to reflectance. To do that, you need a white reference. You need to take the white reference to go from radiance to reflectance from a radiance modified cube. That being said, I specifically chose this one because it has a reflectance tarp in it. We've got the tarp right here. You will notice a couple of things. The most evident is that it has small wrinkles in it. That is, you can't have something that is flexible and completely flat. We want to zoom in as close as possible because I'm going to do the following. I place the cursor over a selected pixel, right click, and I get these options. I want to use a quick scene white reference. What that does is that it uses that particular pixel as the white reference for the entire scene. So I click OK and it tells me it's using this reflectance profile, which is in your sensor config folder, and it is saving that particular reference as scene white reference, and it's going to be in my data folder. Again, I can put this anywhere I want. In this case, for simplicity, I'm leaving it in the data folder. So I click OK. Now, if I return to that data folder, I will see at the bottom, scene white reference. Today's date, today's time. This is now what I'm going to use for the following. Let me zoom out by left clicking that icon. I'm going to adjust this particular data cube to enable the reflectance calibration to be done on the data. I click the reflectance button. It automatically pulls up the scene white reference, the header and data file that will be converted. Note that they have the suffix RD, and it's going to be an RF when done, as you can see there. That means it will be a reflectance cube. If you don't have a scene white reference, when you click that reference reflectance button, you will have an error pop up saying that it cannot find the scene white reference. You have a choice. If you put this somewhere else, navigate to it. If the error is such that you didn't create one, go
go ahead and create one and do it again. That said, let me create the reflectance cube. And I will open it, again selecting all the wavelengths. Radiance cube. Reflectance cube. So the reflectance is done on one data cube. Okay. We want to do all of them. So we do a reflectance batch. Again, going back in, I'm selecting the radiance cubes that we did as a batch previously. So I'll left click, hold down control, select the desired data cubes. Click open. All the files then load into the batch reflectance application. Click next. Notice again, it is going directly to the folder containing the scene white reference. All of the wavelengths are selected. And we will create a radiance batch. Okay, the reflectance batch completes. And the larger the file, that is the larger the number of data cubes, the longer it will obviously take. So we click cancel, and then we can go ahead and open one of those data cubes that we just made. We'll select this one arbitrarily. Select all of these. And test to make sure that it is a reflectance data cube. Yes, it is. And that's it. When flying one of our sensors for hyperspectral data collection, you have to remember you're flying over the ground. The sensor collects all the data, but it is of no value until you can place that data to a certain location on the planet. That is the process of orthorectification, which is taking raw data, transforming it to the shape that fits a particular area on the planet where the scan was done. Additionally, because the data is collected in multiple data cubes, and these combined are multiple flight lines in a an entire area that is captured then the second part of orthorectification is not only placing one data cube onto the ground but taking all of those each data cube from each flight line and doing it as an entire batch this batch processing is called multi-orthorectification this is something that's done with a DEM file, which is a representation of what the planet looks like in a very select point where your data was scanned. The planet's irregular, and we adapt your data to compensate for those irregularities that will be seen on the planet. When we take a look at doing the hyperspectral post-processing, first thing to look at is the presence of a number of files. In this case, we've got the Aplanix, which is the high-end IMU for Headwall. This is the series of files that come from the APX-15. We used a base station in this case, so these files are present. Importantly, for the hyperspectral side, we have a dark reference which was taken before the flight launched. During the flight, you get frame index files, 
you get a GPS monitor, which is the flight path that is followed by the drone, IMU GPS. In this case, we're also flying LIDAR, so you'll get LIDAR data. You will get the PCAP files, especially the IDX file. Going down, because we've got uh, PPS enabled on this particular configuration, it will generate these files as well. And then finally, the hyperspectral data. And it is sequential. So this is the first flight line, the second flight line is here, and so forth. Now, when we look at these, before we start doing anything, we always generate the data into an image. And this is done when downloading from the Nano. It makes it very easy to analyze where you are and come up with some good options for developing your initial data cube. Because the way that we do it here is we will make a single data cube and get that reasonably accurate and then do a multi-ortho on top of that. Looking at these pictures, we've got one flight over a parking lot. We've got a flight over part of the lot. Another section. And finally here. This area right here is one of the tarps that we use. It is a reflectance tarp. You can see it in this picture. It's weighted down, that's the black spot. We also have some targets that we put down in line with it. Those are of no importance at the moment. The important thing is that this tarp is square, exactly square, three by three meters. In order to get the altitude offset correct, an altitude is the one aspect of an IMU that is the least accurate, we use something that is of a fixed geometry, fixed dimensions, known dimensions. So in this case, we're going to start off with this data cube, 9440, because it has a defined geometry in it that we can use. And I'll show you how that works. So we return to the folder. This is 9440. We open it in spectral view, which is the post-processing software. Because we're doing the first pass on multi-ortho, on single ortho, for expediency, choose the RGB. Three wavelengths visible to the eye. We open the cube. And as you can see, the data cube here is just like the image here. When you start out doing the first data cube, just click the ortho button. Now, with each system that ships within a sample data cube that you receive is an ortho.ini file. That file enables you to use those bore-sided values that are developed here at the Headwall facility. Bore sighting for your IMU for LIDAR or just the IMU and hyperspectral makes your starting point almost perfect for what we want to do. Now, spectral view pulls in the values here from either the registry or the ortho INI. In this case, it's the registry. So I'm going to set those arbitrarily to zero right now. I'm going to open the advanced settings. What this shows is the following. We used a nano sensor. We use the Aplanix IMU. So those are selected. What that also means is because we use the Aplanix, we are using the PPS text and we're using the post-processing file. That is this right here. It has to start with the letters S-B-E-T, and it is a dot .out file. The software automatically selects the DEM that corresponds to the 
lat long identified in the out file. You want to save your values locally, which means all you're doing is saving the values in this box in the directory that contains the data itself. So with this, we'll do the following. Click Start, and we get a result. Let me zoom in for a minute. You can see that there is the tarp. It doesn't look to my eyes to be exactly square, but don't leave it to chance. Click Next, and this allows us to create the data cube itself. Three selected wavelengths, RGB. Create the cube, we'll open the cube. Now, I'm not sure if that's square or not. It could be. To see if it is, I'm going to take a snapshot create a PNG image and this is defaulted to be that data file under bar OR ortho rectify so let's save that a free piece of software that we used is image J specifically made for analyzing images such as hyperspectral images this right here is that image I just made. So if we take this, bring it up here, load it to image J, it pops up. I'm going to zoom in on the tarp. And you'll notice that it's a little bit off at an angle. That's okay. What I'm really interested in is, are the two sides set at 90 degrees the same length? To do that, I take this line, I'm going to drag it from that point to this point. And if you look up at the image J, it says the length is 86.7 pixels. Now, with the same hand, I'm going to go from this point to this point. And it says the length is 92.4 pixels in the image J, 92.7 now. So that means this dimension is longer than this dimension. So I have to shrink this way while expanding in this direction. So my values need to be reset. And I'll show you what that means. As we just saw, the dimensions are off when we do the ortho. This is the direction of flight. So with that in mind, this therefore has to be the roll direction. And the yaw would be this going off at an angle. We don't see much angularity here perhaps a little bit, but the pitch is definitely off. The other thing that is off is the altitude. That really sets the basis for whether something is square or of the correct geometry in any case, or if it is not. We're using something called a geoid correction here, which is a bit of software within spectral view which corrects the uh, WGS84 to the EGM95, which is the geoid to the WGS84 representation of the planet. Through experience, we happen to know that we're requiring about a three meter offset where we are physically located. Any user, anywhere on the planet will most likely have to make a very small altitude adjustment here 
we're talking one, two, three meters, as long as your geoid correction is selected. If this is not selected, you're going to be using another tool to be able to come up with this altitude offset. Why bother? Just check the box and make this small adjustment. To that point, let me show you what the result is. If we again do the ortho and just go through the same exact steps, creating the cube, opening the cube, which overwrites the previous one, saving the snapshot, which will overwrite the previous one, and then again opening that in image J. Let's see what the difference is. So we'll take the same line. We'll do it as we did previously. This is 88.48. This dimension here is 86.13. Not completely square, but very close to it, within two pixels. Because we're looking for accuracy, because we want to do a multi-ortho setting a number of these flight lines together, we're going to do one more time with a minor altitude adjustment above what we've already done. After you've done a few of these, or a number of them, you'll find that this becomes almost second nature. Remember we had this at 3, let me change it to 3.25. We're going to save this in the data file. We're going to make sure that the PPS is checked. The Aplanix is here. We want to make sure that we're using the out file. And then we'll save that ortho.ini that's generated. Overwrite the existing image. Once again, load that into image J. Same as before, expand it. And just as before, measure it. 86.72, 86.30, within 0.4 pixels of being dead square. I call that success. And when you correlate it to the ground itself, what you're looking at is uh, 3 meters divided by 86, and then you're off by... three centimeters per pixel. So I was off by six centimeters. Now, I want to get back to one thing real quickly. I mentioned before that when you get your sensor, you get an ortho INI file that comes with it. That contains the values that we are stepping through here. The reason I'm beginning from the very baseline of all zeros is so that you can understand all the fundamentals that go into it and not just get a single ortho INI file with the system and make small changes from there. This is from the ground up methodology. We're going to do this next step because what I want to do, I've ortho rectified this and I can see, yeah, it looks pretty good. And if we take that ortho rectified file and open it, which is this one here. We can lay it onto Google Maps and it comes out pretty decently. Notice there are only three wavelengths. And to put it onto Google Maps, you click that and it lays it down on Google Maps.
and you can look at it and say, yeah, that's kind of close. These lines are off a little bit, that's pitch. If your flight direction is this way, this is pitch from here to here. You'll notice these lines are offset from here a little bit. That is a roll function. So if you're going in this direction, it's the roll of the aircraft. In this direction, it's the pitch. So the next thing I want to do is take a look at what I have and compare that to another flight line. This is the first of the multi-ortho steps. Okay, to do the multi-ortho, we will open this one right here, 11744. This particular data cube is the one adjacent to the 9440, which we did previously. You can tell that because the tarp is right here in scene. So we'll use the same values on this data cube, which is the 11744, as we did on the 9440. You'll see that window open in a second and it will be pre-populated with the ortho INI files saved in the data folder. Three and a quarter meter altitude offset. We've got the Atlantics. We've got the out file here using the PPS. use this and just create these IGM files. As I mentioned earlier, the IGMs are used to do the multi-ortho stitching of data cubes. So again, we've got the tarp right here and the previous data cube we did is going to lay down right over this tarp. Do the multi ortho stitching these two together that we just did. The 944 and the 11744. Again, just using RGB. And this is the way the two pieces lay down. Now, you're going to ask yourself why is there a gap here and a gap here? Because we took a flight line capturing a full 2,000 frame data cube, started creating a second data cube here, and then at this point, right here, right here is where the boundary was for the capture polygon, so it stops capturing. Drone flies out, comes back, the minute it crosses that boundary, it starts capturing again. A 2,000 frame data cube starts a new one to right here, where it once again exits the capture polygon. So in your data, if you see gaps like this where you're putting non-sequential data cubes together, it's common, it means you were doing a good job. So we'll create this data cube. And when the data cube process is complete, we can then open it. Let's see what we have. This is a very useful learning process, and I'll show you why. This piece right here, from this corner to this corner, is the white part of the tarp, which is supposed to be from here to here. But it is not, which means we have a pitch offset. So, flight is going this way in this data cube and this way in this data cube. Our pitch is not exact and that amount that it is off is approximately one and a half meters. We know this because this tarp is three meters wide and we're about 50% of the tarp off. In other words, we have to put a pitch offset in 
to make this work. Now, even when you do have the ortho INI and you're out flying your own missions, there will be times when because of gimbal balance, because of headwind, because of tailwind, because of a multitude of factors, you're going to have to make a small adjustment to the pitch and or the roll of your data. Now, one of the things that you want to look at is if we're off by a half meter or one meter or two meters, get something that's referenceable. In this case, we're off by one and a half meters and we're flying at a 30 meter altitude. So what we need is the arc tangent of 0 0.05. We want the angle in degrees. It's 2.8 degrees. However, remember, we're off by one and a half meters in two directions, forward and backward, which really turns out to be three quarters of a meter in one direction or half of this angle value, about 1.4. So if we take this and this and make that adjustment, we should get something very accurate. Let's do it as a batch, an orthorectification batch, where we will take those two particular data cubes, we'll open them up, Once these open, we'll go to the next step, and this is identical to the orthorectification we were doing before, except what we want to do is the following. This pitch, we want half of 2.8 if we're flying at 30 meters. We'll call that 1.4. We want to save this because we made a change to the ortho INI. We will save it. We will then go to next. And all this process is doing right now for those IGM files right here is it's putting each pixel in the correct geographic point to cause an ortho rectified data cube to exist. It's not doing anything with wavelengths. It's just a matter of this pixel belongs at this point based on this IMU and flight time and speed, altitude, and all the offsets. At which point we just click start and allow the process to proceed. So this is done. You see nothing after it happens. It's simply generated the IGM files for these two data cubes. So we close out, we go to the corrections, multi-ortho, and we're going to stitch those two IGMs together that we just made. Again, we're going to do it in RGB initially for a matter of speed. These are the data cubes again, very similar to what you saw before. Create that cube, then we'll open it to see what the results are. Notice this is the residue, the image of one of the tarps. This is the image of the other. Nowhere near as close as they were previously. There is a simple reason for that, and you will see this over and over. The distance got greater because when we did the batch, we had a positive value. Okay, so we open these two, just as before we go to the next button. Notice the pitch right here is a positive value. That caused the separation to be greater than what we wanted. If you make it a negative value, it's going to change it in the opposite direction. So we go 
go through the same steps. Click Start. Okay, we're done the batch ortho for these two files again, but with the changed sign on the pitch. So we'll close that. We'll open the multi-ortho process, select those same two IGM files. Use again the RGB. And we will create the data cube. Okay, we've run it through the multi-ortho process. Now let's open it up and see what it looks like. Initially when we started this, this portion here was down in this section. Now we've gone the other way. And we've gone the other way by about the same distance that we were over here. So that means either of two things, and it's important to note. One is either the math was incorrect or the altitude was off. In this particular case, you don't always recall or have notice of what the altitude was. If you see something where you think it is 30 meters and you make that adjustment to adjust for 30 meters, but it is more, what you are really discovering is that the altitude was different than what you thought it was. In this particular case, because it's overshot by approximately the same amount, that means that we were flying not at 30 meters, but probably closer to 50. That would compensate this much in this direction. Not full, not full doubling, which would be 60 meters, but a little bit less. I'll show you how to adjust that in a minute. There is another piece to this, however. This white part here should in fact be underneath this white part here. The difference between this side and this side being exactly overlaid is the roll. Roll is in this direction on your flights. So let's make two adjustments right here, right now. I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it onto Google Maps so that we've got a reference to go by. So we've got this as a reference. We'll go back to this Arctan for a minute. And let's say, again, we were off by 1.5 meters, but we were flying at 50 meters. That means we want the arctan of not 05, but 03. We calculate that, it comes out to 1.72. We'll call it 1.7, but it's only half of that that we're going to use because we're going in two directions. So half of that is going to be round numbers, about 0.85. Go back to the batch. Do one last time. Select these two. Open them. Okay, we're going to keep the sign the same exact that it is. However, remember we're changing it to 0.085. I'm sorry, 0.85. And the roll, as I mentioned, was off slightly. We're going to make a very, very small adjustment to the roll. We're using PPS. We want to save this new ortho INI, which we just constructed here, and create these IGM files. Okay, the ortho batch process is complete. Now we'll do the multi-ortho and stitch them together and you'll see what the difference is. Now keep in mind, when you get your initial system and it comes with the data cube already processed, 
you have this ortho I and I ready. What I am showing you here today is going from scratch so that you can see every possible opportunity for something to not be right. Having seen it, you will know how to compensate for it when you are using your own data. So we'll create this cube. And this should be the last time or very close to the last time that we've got to make any iterations to this particular process. Okay, when the process completes, again, same steps, open it. That is very close to what you want. Notice that the white is almost completely underneath your offset is a couple of centimeters maybe. Now if we take this and we lay this onto Google Earth, you'll see what the result is. One thing that we like to do for working here at Headwall is to see approximately how close we are to Google Maps. Keep in mind, and please do not do this, do not attempt to overlay what you have exactly onto Google Maps. Reason is this, we're using, in this case, an Aplanix IMU. This has a, an accuracy of 10 centimeters. Google Maps and Google Earth have an accuracy of three to four meters. So you're taking something that's a very fine resolution and trying to line it up to something that's a coarse resolution with the Google and it is not going to be pretty, do not do it. The flight data that you have collected with the headwall unit should be stitched together so that it is useful unto itself, not related to anything that's a second or third party scan. This if you look at it closely, you get a complete island here, complete island here. We have offsets to the lines in Google on the roll side, but they are uniform from here to here. This is important. These are uniform. So now, with this accuracy that we have, what we want to do is a number of the cubes. So the final step will be, okay, I've got one data cube that came out well, I matched that to a second, so that I've got the flight orientation correct for both my roll, pitch, and yaw. Let's just take, let's see, I'm gonna do this one over, I have to do that one, this one as well. We'll throw that one in. We know these two IGMs are good. Those are the ones we just put together. We are going to make a batch with a number of the other cubes that we have, and we will then stitch all those to the two prior ones to come up with a full scene orthorectified image. Here we've loaded these remaining data cubes from this flight. We have the out file. We have PPS selected. We're using the nano with the Aplanix. These are the values that we had in there on the two data cubes that we stitched together. So this ortho Y and I already exists, but out of habit, always check that box so you don't lose anything click next and this is going to just generate those IGM files click start this will take a couple of minutes but in the video it will be trimmed down okay the ortho rectification batch finishes everything is blue which means it processed properly just close that out go to corrections multi ortho now we already did this one and this one, put them together, they worked. 
we're going to take all of them, put them all together, and make that final scene that would result from multiple flight lines over a particular area of interest. Again, because we're just doing ortho, we're just going to do the RGB for this particular example. Now, all these data cubes in spectral view, if you hover over, you get the number. That's 11,440. This is your 9,440. This is the 1174 that we matched to this earlier. This right here is the 1448, which matches to this one. Let's stitch them and see what happens. Now additionally, as I told you before, flight line starts here, 2000 frame cube, starts the next cube, exits. Comes back in, 2000 frame cube, restarts a cube, exits. You can see that whole process and this is how it's very easy to tell what the direction of flight is. Okay, the multi-ortho process has finished. We've got all of these data cubes stitched together. We'll open them. Check out the quality of the work. Zooming in. We are off a small amount on the pitch on this. Small amount on the pitch here. Now, we know that this is pretty accurate at this point for square as well as for pitch and roll. We'll see this particular berm right here is about eight inches wide, so we're using about six of those. We've got about a two inch section right here that matches up, so we're off by about six inches, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of about 12 centimeters on this flight line, but on the previous two we are not. What does that tell you? We're off on pitch. That means that the wind was blowing in a certain way for this particular flight line that it wasn't for these two. This gets to the point that sometimes when you are flying, you will have variability in your flight conditions. So you will have to do what I did, but only for some of these. And then over here, adjust these to line up with this one to get everything matching perfectly. So your pitch would have to be further adjusted. In this case, you're looking at six inches over 50 meters. So your adjustment is going to be 0 0.02, 0 0.03 at most to get that six inch delta right here. So again, don't become discouraged if all the flight lines line up and one doesn't. This is where you need to talk to your pilot, find out flight conditions, find out anything that changed during your mission. So that is the multi-ortho process.